school teacher says rote memory or not memory but rote you know do it over and over and over repeat it often enough and it uh, becomes something that we learn or something that becomes part of us but last week we looked at five different reasons why he came to earth and uh, and I just want to look at, at uh, three more this morning that I believe are closely tied with the ones that we looked at last week. And these are just only a few of a, can I use the word jillions, uh, reasons why he came to earth and what a tremendous blessing that is. And I'm glad that he did come to earth. But, you know, for some, Christmas time is a time to get presents. And for others, you know, uh, he just came to cause trouble. Isn't that what was happening in his world that he was living in? Uh, seemed like wherever he went, there was trouble. Not because of him, but because of people not wanting to accept him for who he was and the gift that he came to bring. For some, he came to bring life and hope. And that, I hope, is for each one of us here, that he came to bring life and hope for each one of us. Uh, that's why he, one of the reasons why he came. My well, question this morning is, what does his coming mean to us? Is it just a, a time of getting a present or giving a present or uh, some of these other things? But I hope it's more than that. I hope it's a time that we realize that he came down here, and I'm sure we do, but just that he came down here to give us life and give us a life abundant, as Scripture tells us. Each one of us has to answer the question for ourselves, what does this coming mean to me? What does this coming mean to you? And I just want to suggest three more reasons why he came. First is he came to change our past life. And we touched on that a little bit last week, but uh, I just want to expand a little bit more on that. Aren't you glad that he came to, to change our past life? You know, I, I mentioned last week that I think we probably all have done something in our past life that we would rather w wish now that we hadn't done. But, uh, you know, what's in the past is past, and, and we can't change that now. But we can go on from here. But he also came to change our old nature. You know, the, the, uh, the Bible tells us that prior to our accepting him and the work that he did for us there on the cross, we had an old nature, and I'm not suggesting that we get rid of that, that we have gotten rid of that old nature when we accept him, because I don't believe that we do get rid of that old nature. We have two natures, a new nature that he gives to us. <clears throat> and just the, the fact that he, he changed our past life and hopefully is changing our life now and changing our life for the future. But... He came to break the power of Satan over in Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Acts, 20, Acts 26, verse 18 it says, To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and may rest and, and uh, an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. But to change from the power of Satan. You know, prior to accepting Christ as our Savior, he's in control of us. Whether we believe it or not, or whether we see it or not, he is still in control of us and our lives, and we're, we basically do whatever he wants for us to do. But it doesn't have to be that way. And Jesus came to break that power that Satan has over us. <clears throat> Satan blinds and binds the believer. And, you know, we all start out in, in, under bondage to him, don't we, as, as little kids or from conception on, basically. But especially when we're, we're born, we are in, under his control in a sense. And uh, he's our, our master, but he doesn't have to be. God came to break that power of sin. He binds and blinds the eyes of the unbeliever and, again, controls them. You know, because he's as powerful as he is, we can't resist him in our own strength. I don't know if you've ever tried that or not, but it doesn't work. If you have tried it, it doesn't work, does it? We can't resist him in our own strength. But I'm glad that we can resist him through what Jesus Christ has done for us there 
in coming down here to earth as a babe and living here and just enabling us to have that power to break the power that Satan has and to allow him to work in us. Only Christ can break that power that Satan has in our lives as we look to him. Aren't you glad that he came to earth to do that? You know, I'm glad that we don't have to be under his control, under the control of Satan. Now, I realize there's times when we still sin. We're not sinless, but there's times when we still sin. But I'm glad that we don't have to sin, and we we have that power that, uh, that's been broken through what Jesus did for us there. He came to break the power of Satan. He came to remove the fear of death over in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, Inasmuch then, oops, that's okay. Yeah, inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, th same that through death he might destroy, the, destroy him who had the power of death, and that is the devil, and released, uh, and released those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Do you ever know anybody that's, that's fear of death? You know, I think that's probably some of our nature, basically, isn't it? I mean, well, we probably don't, as Christians, we don't fear where we're going but we fear how we're going to get there. Do you know what I'm saying? Isn't that what it seems to be like? We, we fear that, that process that we might go through, but we don't have to fear death itself. But for an unbeliever who is going to spend eternity apart from Christ in hell, uh, they have an awful lot to be afraid of. And, uh, you know, I've heard stories of, of people who are on their deathbed and dying and how they're so afraid. And, you know, I've heard stories of people who are, as believers, are looking forward to that time and maybe you know something like that yourself we do you know we're looking forward to that time and we really be disappointed if the lord didn't take them uh, whenever he did and some at an earlier age and some at an old at an older age but just the fact that as believers we don't have to fear death anymore he came jesus came to remove that fear of death you know i believe satan uses the fear of death as a means of keeping us in bondage to himself. David says in Psalm 23, verse 4, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You know, when God's with us, it makes a big difference, doesn't it? And we don't have to be afraid of, and you can fill in whatever there, we don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of this or afraid of that or the future or you know, when we look at it, at the future from a human perspective, it looks pretty bleak, doesn't it? But when we look at it through God's perspective, he's just getting everything ready. We talked about these earthquakes a second ago, you know, just getting ready for the time when he's coming back. And so he's preparing that for us. But we don't have to fear that time. We can look forward and, and really look forward to it. Took away the sting of death when he came. Another reason to be glad that Jesus came to earth was not only to change our past life, but also to enrich our present life. You know, it's not just a past thing, and it's great that he did come, and that we, as those of us who have accepted him as our, as our Savior, uh, that's tremendous past. But what about right now? How is he working in your life? How is he working in my life right now? He came to enrich that, to make it better than what just a normal person you know, it's really sad for a person who is not a Christian, the things that they go through, and you probably have talked to some from time to time, and just the struggles and the fears and all the different things that they are faced with uh, that we as Christians don't have to be afraid of. We don't have to fear those things. But he came to enrich our present life. How? I believe one way is by giving us peace. Over in Philippians chapter 4, verse uh, Chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We can't even begin to comprehend that peace that God is willing to give us and wants to give us and does give us as we look to him in whatever the situation might be. Came to give us joy and peace. You know, and that's something that only the child of God has and has a, a special privilege of receiving that gift that God gives to us. I was listening to a uh, pastor on the radio, I think it was our television, I mean, I think it was last night or maybe the night before, some different gifts that God has given to us. And he was basically saying, well, one of the gifts was forgiveness, to be able to forgive. You know, as a non-Christian, we have difficulty in that area, don't we? But as a Christian, we shouldn't have difficulty. And he was listing off some different, different uh, gifts that God has given to us. And, of course, obviously the number one gift is the Lord himself, uh, Jesus. But give us joy and peace, a peace and a joy that's beyond explanation. You know, we can try, but how do we explain the joy and the peace that comes from knowing Christ as our Savior? 1 Peter 1, 8 says, Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You know, we just stop and think about that. What a tremendous, tremendous uh, blessing it is that comes along with just knowing him as our Savior. And for those that don't know him, they're missing out on a tremendous amount, aren't they? But as we seek him with our whole heart, he in turn treats us like a father would treat his son. You know, wants what's best for us. And I didn't write this verse down, but I think it's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, I think it is, that every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father above in whom there's no variable nor shadow of turning every good gift and every perfect gift comes from him can you get any better than that you know you might get a new pocket knife for Christmas or a new pair of shoes for Christmas or something like this and those things may be good but they don't compare at all do they with what the Lord has given us through his son there and how, how we need to be thankful for that and this gift that he's given us in his son brings great joy and an earthly level on an earthly level but how much more on a heavenly heavenly level when we think of what he's done for us and what's what's in the future for us you know the bible says that if in this life only we are uh of all men most miserable if, if this is all we have to look forward to boy we don't have much to look forward to do we but when we have heaven to look forward to what a difference that makes and, or at least it should make in our lives. <clears throat> and nothing can enrich our lives more than having this peace and joy. If Jesus had not come to earth, we wouldn't have that. Uh, we wouldn't have that peace and joy that comes only through him and uh, the gift that God sent down here for us. Peace and joy are part of the fruit given to us by the Holy Spirit. If you know what those fruits are, the fruit of the Holy Spirit love joy peace it all is there's part of it and he came by helping us in every trouble over in isaiah chapter 41 isaiah chapter 41 <clears throat> verse 10 isaiah 41 verse 10 says fear not for i am with you be not dismayed for i am your god i will strengthen you yes i will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We don't have to be afraid because he's there to help us. Whatever the situation is, whatever the trouble might be, he's there to help us in that particular situation if we just allow him to do it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Uh, Psalm says there, Psalm, uh, Pro Proverbs, thank you, Proverbs 3, Four, three, five, and six. Yeah, uh, I'm glad I got some help in here. And if I need help, don't be afraid to give it to me, okay? Because I, you know, if I were perfect, I would need that. But it just goes to show you I'm not perfect. But anyhow, you know that we don't need to to, to trust in ourselves, but we simply need to just trust in the Lord and allow Him to to work 
in and through us, and he's willing to meet those different needs and difficulties and struggles that we go through. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, uh, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things. Nope, that's not it. Uh, there is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. He's made a way of escape. It's already done. All we have to do is put it into practice by helping us in every situation, in every test, every trial that we go through. He's there to help us if we just allow him to do that. <clears throat> and then... Uh, by adopting us into the family of God, John 1, 12. John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Adopting us into his family. He wouldn't have to do that, but he chooses to do that as we put our trust in what he's done for us there on the cross uh, he does that for us I can't help but think of the song of the Gaithers I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God aren't you glad that you're part of God's family you know I believe God's built into each one of us as his children that need that we have for each other uh, you know I used to hear that or see that saying and said something like no man is an island you know we're not an island. We can't stand alone. We need each other, and I'm glad that God built that into us that we do need each other. So the question is, by adopting us into his family, do we have assurance this morning that we're part of God's family? First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, verses 10 through 13. I believe there's some really important verses that we need to get hold of and uh, to stand on on solid ground. There's 1 John chapter 5, starting with verse 10, says, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of, given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may, my Bible says no, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. We can know. Aren't you glad that we can know? I don't, I don't have to. You know, I've talked to people, and maybe you have as well, too. Well, you know, I'll just wait, and when I die, I'll get on the scales and see if the good outweighs the bad and and uh, those kinds of things. I'm glad we don't have to, can I say, take that chance. We can know right now whether we're going to heaven or whether we're not going to heaven. Uh, isn't that what Scripture says, that we can know that we have eternal life? We don't have to wait until we die. We don't have to wait until somewhere down the road. But we can know right now whether we have eternal life. He came to secure our future. Not only to change our past life and to enrich our present life, but he came to secure our future life as well. How is he going to do this? Well, I believe, first of all, one of the ways is by preparing a home for us in heaven. John 14, 2 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Gone to prepare a place for us in heaven. What a tremendous encouragement that ought to be to each one of us. A place that you and I can't even begin to imagine because of our human minds. It's, we can't imagine what that's going to be like, but we know that it's going to be true and it's going to be a place that I don't want to miss. And I suspect that you don't want to miss that as well either. Uh, can you imagine spending eternity in heaven and all the joys and blessings that come with that? No, you're not going to be playing a harp on cloud nine or whatever it is. Uh, that's, that's not true at all. What we're going to be doing there, I don't know. And what it's going to be like, 
We really don't know. But I know one thing, it sure beats going to hell. You know, and what's going to happen there. And the Bible gives us some description of what's going to take place there. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, fire and brimstone. Not the kind of place where I want to spend. And I'm sure you don't want to as well. But he's gone to heaven to prepare for us a home there. You know, there's no problem with the preparation of the place. But what about our preparation of the person right now? God's at work in our lives. Or if we're his children, he's at work in our lives. You know, when your kids were growing up, uh, all of us here have had kids. When your kids were growing up, were they perfect? Well, probably not. Uh, there is one that was perfect, but it wasn't mine. And I suspect that it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, and I suspect that it wasn't yours as well either. But, you know, just the fact that uh, God's at work in our lives and uh, preparing us, preparing us, preparing us, preparing us for that time when we'll be with him. And you know what? When that time comes, we're going to be declared righteous. And what a what a, a change that's going to be. I hope it doesn't mean too much of a change, you know, but there's a, a little bit of a change there from what you are now to what you're going to be. But God is going to prepare, uh, God's going to declare us righteous when we stand before him. You know, it's kind of like being in the clay, being the clay in the potter's hands, isn't it? He wants to make us and mold us and shape us into what he wants us to be. And each one of us are different. None of us are exactly the same. Uh, and God made us that way, and I'm glad that he did. By preparing a home for us in heaven, by giving us crowns. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Another one of the things that we have to look forward to, he says, Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who love, who have loved his appearing. So if you loved his appearing and are waiting for that and have accepted that that he did on the cross for us, you'll get a crown of righteousness, according to what Paul says. He's not the only one who's going to get one. All God's children are going to get that crown of righteousness. <clears throat> what, a, what an encouragement that is. And then by standing up for us at the judgment in Romans chapter 8, verses 33 and 34. Romans chapter 8, verses 33 and 34. says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, I think I skipped one, didn't I? I should have read verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. And furthermore, is, uh, who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Standing between us and God is, isn't... Uh, there in Timothy someplace it says that there's a one God and one mediator between man and, and the man, and the man anyhow, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Or I think it's in first Timothy chapter three, I believe, verse sixteen. But anyway, uh, just the just the fact that he's going to stand up for us in the time of uh, of judgment when we stand at the beam of seat of Christ and you know, as a believer, you're not going to stand at the great white throne judgment. Only non-believers are going to be there and stand before that. And those who are at the great white throne judgment are doomed to spend eternity in hell. But those who are his children, God's children, Jesus came and died for, are going to go at, before the judgment seat of Christ, at the Bema seat, they call it, and are going to give an account for the things that we've done in the past. You can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There's some verses there that talk about that. <clears throat> but I'm glad, and aren't you glad, that he came here to do all that he did for each one of us. 
for those of us who have accepted him. And then by giving us victory over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 51, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpets will sound and the dead will rise, uh, be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on mortality, uh, immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is in sin, and the sting and the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. These old corrupt bodies that are decaying, and uh, he's going to change into an, a body that's incorruptible. And that's what he's talking about here, that this body is going to be changed, and we're going to have victory over death. Right now, uh, we don't have that. Well, we have that victory as, as his believers. We have that victory, but we haven't fully realized it as such yet. But one of these days, when he comes for his own, we're going to see that victory uh, and that corruption, corrupted body put on a new body that's incorruptible. So have you been redeemed? Have you been reconciled? You know, it's, a, it's a important that we have. And so how does one experience the kind of life that we have been talking about this morning? First, we have to recognize we're a sinner, don't we? That's the starting point. We have to recognize that we're a sinner. And Jerry was talking this morning in the Sunday school class about repentance and the need for repent. And so that's the second thing we have to do. Not only recognize we're a sinner, but we have to repent. And the third thing is to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And fourth, to receive him into our lives. And only, had, only when we have done these things can we say, Oh, come, let us adore him. And joy to the world, the Lord is come. And we're not going to be able to say that unless, uh, honestly say that. And I realize there's people in the world that sing those words but really have no meaning to them. But for the child of God, they really do have meaning, don't they? Let us adore him and let us uh, enjoy to the world he's come. I'm glad that he came. I trust that you're glad that he came. And we have a whole lot more to look forward to in the future and when that will be, I don't know. But uh, we know it's coming and we have that to look forward to. I just, I trust you're encouraged as we come to this season of Christmas and the fact that Jesus came down here as a little babe and, and lived in the manger and, and was born, not lived in it, was born in a manger and then lived here on earth and, and grew up basically like we do with one exception. And, uh, you know, what a, what a tremendous encouragement that is to know that one of these days, as believers, we'll get to see him. We have that to look forward to. So I just, I hope you're encouraged, and I hope you're, you're blessed, and you're looking forward to that time. And, uh, well, we just have a lot to look forward to, don't we? Let's, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this morning and for being with us and for all that you've done for us. There's no way we could even begin to scratch the surface of what that all means, but just a few thoughts that help, I hope, spark us in that direction to to be the kind of person, first of all, to accept you and then to be the kind of person that you want for us to be, not the kind that we want, but the kind that you want for us to be. And it's sad that so many people who have accepted you are doing their own thing and not allowing you to live in their lives. And so I just pray that you would help us to not be that kind of person, but to be the kind of person who is, is thankful for your coming and all that you've done for us. So thank you for these things, for this season. 
And I pray that you would just be with each one of us and bless us this week. We pray in your name.